Good evening and welcome to another interview with uh, Alex Case here for Play With Your Music. We're very thrilled to have a second interview with Alex to talk with us a little bit about the creative and musical uses of audio effects in the recording process. Hi, Alex. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. So glad you're here. So glad we uh, uh, have an opportunity to redo this interview. We tried it first uh, on, on our normal time on Saturday, and the bandwidth just didn't... Uh, didn't allow it to happen, and so now here we are again. So why don't we go ahead and dig right in. Um, I guess uh, a good place to start we, uh, would be to have you start uh, sharing a little bit with us about what should we be thinking about as, uh, as we approach this mix uh, project. What should we be thinking about audio effects um, before we actually start diving into it? Uh, is there anything we should do uh, at the very beginning to get going? Absolutely. The uh, the I'm I won't project this onto you, but I'm guilty of this. The recording studio can be a really fun place to play. The digital audio workstation gives us so many options and so many possibilities that uh, all too often I I won't say you I sort of follow follow my way down these rabbit holes of isn't this cool when I put this effect on this thing and do this and and so it's quite easy to get distracted by things that are fun. There's a gee whiz factor that can entertain all of us the same way I hope you felt the first time you picked up a guitar if you're a guitarist or a didgeridoo if you're a didgeridooist. And uh, I don't know what you call a didgeridoo player actually, but I'm going to go with didgeridooist. <laughs> a didgeridontist maybe if I'm playing. But anyway, so you sh you're allowed to have that infatuation with the instrument but recognize that those things can be a little bit distracting and not always productive. So give yourself the chance to play and to do those things. Those are learning moments for sure, but when, when, you, when you start to think about mixing and you start to take on the really daunting task of how to build a mix and how to think about reverb and delay and equalization and compression and all the other possibilities, it's essential that you get the foundation of the mix correct. I think we spoke about it last time, but the mix has to be balanced, and and that is really essential, actually. We have to keep in mind that the mix has to be balanced. You keep that in mind the whole time you're working on a project, and when I say balanced, what I really mean is faders and pan pots. Setting the levels right so that you can, for most styles of music, always hear the vocal, always hear the kick, the snare, and the bass, and then all the other stuff underneath making sure those never get drowned out by a really fun idea you have for a swirling echo effect on the tambourine or whatever, making sure the mix stays balanced, that the foundational stuff is right. You can always hear those core elements of the tune. That has to be there first before you dive into the other sort of fun aspects of mixing. Great. So uh, I guess then now that we, if we've, ha if we've set our foundation well and we're ready to go, um, this week uh, in the course, we're focusing on three basic effects within Soundation. You know, we have the our, our dry stem mix ready to go, and uh, the first three sets of effects we've uh, introduced are filter and EQ, reverb, and uh, delay. And I'm wondering if you could uh, spend a few minutes talking and giving us a gentle introduction uh, to those three sets of effects in particular. Sure, it's a pleasure. Uh, I'll try to stay gentle recognizing that I'm rather passionate about this stuff. Uh, I, if, if the videos, if we're still doing this interview in 10 hours, someone shut me up. Um, let's start with EQ first. EQ and filters are very similar effects, and I think they're the most accessible effect for us because they are variations on the tone control that's on every home stereo anyway. So it's a control that's on my mom's stereo, so it must be fairly intuitive to use. I'm pretty sure my mom's not taking the MOOC, but we'll find out. I'll hear from her right away. Um, but so tone controls, the idea that you can uh, change the frequency content of a track, that, that exists for the home user on their whole stereo. We have it track by track. And that comes in a few forms. The equalizer in, within Soundation gives you a low, mid, and high, which amounts to a frequency-specific fader. It lets you turn up and turn down 
low frequency ranges, mid frequency ranges, and high frequency ranges. So it's you can think of it as a frequency specific amplifier or a frequency specific fader. Rather than turning the whole signal up or down, it just grabs a certain frequency range and turns it up or down. So that's what the equalizer does that has low, mid, and high. And in other digital audio workstations, you'll see how that concept of low, mid, and high uh, grows more complicated. You can have a semi-parametric EQ or a fully parametric EQ. All, all that fancy words, all those fancy words mean is that for a low frequency gesture and soundation, in another digital audio workstation, you might be allowed to choose that low frequency. It's fixed in our digital audio workstation in this course, but you might be able to tune that frequency up or down to select a very specific region, and then you choose how much you want to turn that frequency up or down. And then there's another concept, which is the bandwidth of that boost or cut. How, many, how much do you want the neighboring frequencies to be boosted or cutted? Uh, cutted is actually the correct term. When you're um, when you're performing an EQ move, so the EQ we have in Soundation just gives you a fixed low, mid, and high, which is very productive. It's very useful. As you see other equalizers, you'll see that you have these other chances to change the frequency and change the bandwidth that describes how how broad an area you're affecting. Filters are a relation uh, related effect to that. Filters are attenuation only devices, and they basically pull out the highs or they pull out the lows. So a low-pass filter lets the lows through and attenuates the highs. Maybe these hand gestures work. I don't know. <laughs> lows get through and highs get attenuated. And a high-pass filter, the highs get through, so we think of it as flat in the highs, but the lows get attenuated. So it's, a, it's sort of an optimist view of the world. A high-pass filter passes high frequencies, which can only mean it's attenuating lows. And a low-pass filter passes lows unaffected, which means it attenuates the highs. And so that turns out to be a very productive effect. It lets us deal with stuff on the edges, which is a good place to clear out unwanted parts of signals so that we can make room for other attributes elsewhere in our mix or so that we can get rid of sort of ugly parts of a signal for any given track we have. So that's EQ and filter. You can see how I warned you this might take a while. Um, reverb maybe is a little bit simpler because I hope, like me, you were the sort of audio geek who goes into a space, uh, and if you recognize it's likely to be reverberant, you clap your hands and listen. I, I've done that since I was a child. I'm quite sure that part of the reason why I'm in audio is because I also am a broken down choir boy from a church that was quite reverberant, and I, we won't talk about God, but I'm quite sure I'm very into organ and reverb. Uh, because of, of where I was lucky enough to grow up. So I think a lot of humans just love the sound of reverb. If you went into a cave, when you go into a cathedral, don't you want to clap and listen to it? The resonance of a space is reverberation. You make a sound, and that sound ricochets off all the surfaces in the room and makes its way back to your ears. The further it travels, the longer it takes. The bumpier the surface is, the more complex that sound gets. That's reverberation. That's a pretty intuitive concept to most of us. Small rooms are less reverberant than large rooms. And then the treatments within the room might be sound absorptive. Curtains and towels and fuzzy things absorb sound. Or it might be sound reflective. Stone, steel, glass, those things reflect sound. So the more reflective the, the materials in the room are, the more reverberant the space is. The more absorptive the materials in the room are, the shorter the reverb time is. So that's the idea of reverb. It communicates, when it resonates for a long time, it communicates both a large room and a room that has a lot of sound reflective surfaces. A short reverb time can evoke the sense of a smaller space or a space that's more sound absorptive, that has more curtains, like the space behind me now has curtains um, or carpet or upholstered seats and so on. So that's the idea of reverberation. And so we'll introduce artificial reverberation to take a track where we might have had a microphone very close to a singer. So it's recording the direct sound of the singer only with very little natural ambience. We'll introduce supporting ambience to place that close mic recording back into a more realistic context of the singer in a, in a more appropriate space.
Great. Delay. Okay, delay is going to get messy. Is everyone uh, have a sip of tea with caffeine or a cup of coffee? Uh, because delay is at least three things. The idea of delay couldn't be more intuitive. If you introduce delay to a signal, it's going to give you the signal back later in time. But the human ear has a different reaction based on the length of that delay time. So if the delay time is long enough, what you'll hear is a repetition of the signal. I think that's pretty intuitive. If the delay time is long enough, you'll get an echo. You'll get a repetition of the signal that you hear as that's the same signal repeating. But if you shorten the delay, an interesting thing happens. As you shorten the delay, at some point, and, and it depends on the signal itself, but it, at about the 50 to 60 millisecond range, and our delays within Soundation and any digital audio workstation, when you change the delay time, you'll see a, it'll appear on the screen a, a delay time in milliseconds, in thousandths of a second. When, it, when that number is around 50 or 60 milliseconds, an interesting and important thing happens. And that is that the delayed signal perceptually fuses with the undelayed signal. The echo is what happens when the delay time is so long that we hear it as separate events. But get those close enough in time, and we don't hear them as separate events. They start to blur into a single event. But it doesn't mean we don't hear the echo. We hear the inf sorry, we don't hear an echo, but it doesn't mean we don't hear the delay. That's an important distinction. There's a difference between the word echo and delay. The effect is delay, but as I shorten the delay time to something less than 50 or 60 milliseconds, it's no longer an echo. It's now a delay-based effect that changes the timbre of the signal rather than causing a repetition of the signal. So delay times that are long we hear as echoes. If you were to sing at the Grand Canyon, you're going to hear an echo. But delays that happen shorter than about 50 or 60 milliseconds, we still hear the effect. It still has a perceptual impact on the signal, but we no longer hear it as an echo. For delays that are just below that threshold of echo, we call that effect a doubling or a chorus. It sort of sounds like two signals, but not quite. It sort of sounds like two singers singing the same thing in really tight unison, but it's not perfect. So the chorus effect is what happens when you have what, what I would call a medium delay, a delay time in the sort of 20 to 60 millisecond range, which we hear as a slight change in texture of the signal that sort of sounds like two or three people playing, doesn't sound like one person, but it doesn't sound like an echo. If you shorten that delay further still, this is almost over, thanks for hanging in there, but there's a third rich effect in there with delay. The, de the effect is delay, but there's a third sort of result that comes from it. If you tighten the delay time to less than 20 milliseconds, especially to less than 10 milliseconds, to something really tight like one or two milliseconds, now it becomes a completely different sort of sound, which we call comb filtering or flanging. And the flanging effect is quite common in the 60s, and, and you'll hear it a lot uh, in, in recordings today that want to emulate, sort of evoke the idea of the 60s, and, you know, paisleys and, and fuzzy hair and, you know, bell-bottom pants and VW vans and all of that. What's, what's sort of magic about very short delays is that if, uh, if you picture a sine wave, if you picture a waveform that has that sort of characteristic sinusoidal shape, I don't know if that's fair. I could do it like this. Maybe if I, this is not going to go well. But you know what a sine wave looks like, right? So if, uh, if you picture a sine wave, that might represent one frequency. Imagine if you sent it through a delay, and the delay time was exactly equal to the length of one oscillation of a sine wave. So if I had a sine wave oscillating and I send in a delay and, the, and it comes out of the delay and it hits the undelayed signal and the two sine waves are together, if the delay time was exactly equal to the length of time of one oscillation, then you actually make the signal louder. So it, it, this is an important insight. Delay can contribute to a sense of volume if the delay time happens to be the same as the duration of one cycle, that frequency will get louder. But we're not done yet. Alex can't stop me now. If the delay time happened to equal half a cycle, another profoundly important thing happens. 
if the delay time equals half a cycle, then the delay meets up with the undelayed signal, and they're perfectly opposed to each other, and they'll cancel each other. So now we have a delay, a single delay time, that causes some frequencies to double in amplitude, and other frequencies absolutely cancel out. So if you play not a sine wave, but you play guitar, voice, piano, something with energy at a range of frequencies, and you run it through a very short delay time, you end up with some frequencies getting louder and other frequencies getting softer. It's an alternative to equalization that we were talking about first. You get a radically changed spectral content. Some frequencies are doubled in amplitude, other frequencies cancel outright, and the frequencies in between get some other sort of treatment. And so we call that comb filtering because the frequency response looks like teeth on a comb. And I hope that we can provide you some resources so that you can see comb filtering because all this arm waving is exhausting to do and I imagine rather tedious to look at. But to sum up, delay is really a rich effect. If you have one delay unit, you have the possibility to create echoes or chorusing or as you shorten the delay further still, you end up with comb filtering and flanging, which is a spectral sort of result rather than an echo sort of result. So that's a quick tour. Thanks for hanging in there. A quick tour of EQ, reverb, and delay. Great. No, that's, that's wonderful. Uh, great overview with that. So uh, as you catch your breath <laughs> from that, <laughs> uh, uh, could you talk to us a little bit about, uh, I mean, you, you did this a little bit with filter and EQ, and we've talked a little bit about that, but particularly maybe with um, reverb and delay, any specific uh, recordings that um, you tend to gravitate to as, as, as you see as either particularly effective uses of these effects or uh, musical. You often use that phrase about a musical use of an effect and what that might uh, sound like a good example that uh, for a few of these different things that uh, we might be able to go to and listen. Uh, absolutely. So if um, if you're feeling like typing rather than listening to me, if you type in recordingography.com, it'll take you to my. It's part of the same recordingology blog that I've been inflicting on you uh, in this in this uh, experience, but that'll take you to a list of the recordings that I try to flag for people as a way to hear iconic moments of different effects. So that recordingography, it's very much a wiki. It keeps growing over time. And the int intent is to make it quick for you to hear some examples. So if you go to any entry on the recordingography, uh, if you were to click on reverb or click on flanging or click on echo, you'll see which, I mean, at the moment, there are probably 100 different recordings there, and I try to give you basically a postcard's worth of text. I don't want you to get bogged down in reading. So I try to give you the least amount of text to tell you what I listen for in those recordings. And then there's a chance to listen to the recording via YouTube, and there's also a Spotify playlist associated with all those. Those recordings, I think, are the best examples to go get insight into how people cleverer than I are using all of these effects, reverb, chorus, flange, and echo. And, and I should um, offer some advice on how to listen for it. I think one of the most important things to, to do if you're trying to learn to hear effects is to make your life easier by, first of all, maybe following the recordingography, because I think that's a good list of tunes. And those don't just come from me. They come from colleagues and past students and so on. I think it's a pretty rich list always growing. You should. Uh, there's a form on there, so you can suggest recordings as well. But one theme you're going to see in that is that many of those recordings are kind of old. And it's not because I'm old and square, though I am old and square, but it's because in this day and age, it's so easy to have 100 tracks or more that it can be hard to hear isolated effects. But if you, you don't have to go back very far in time, but in the, in the 70s, things were 16-track and 8-track. And in the 60s, things were four-track or two-track or live to one-track. And so all the recordings on the recordingography, I think, are valid works of art. But some of them come from a time many decades ago because it was a simpler time in the studio. There, it wasn't so easy to build so much richness as we're, we often do today. So you, can, you have the chance to hear an echo effect on the vocal in the Beatles. And then if I told you it was going on in a... Lady Gaga track, you would 
now be able to hear it in a very crowded mix. You could still hear that it's going on, but it's a little bit harder to hear in a contemporary production. So one of the biggest pieces of advice I could give you for learning to hear these effects is to listen, allow yourself, if, you, if there's any music from the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, even into the 90s, if there's any music that you like, go back and, and rock out to it, uh, the music you like, but go listening for effects because in those simpler arrangements, you're now going to notice some echo effects that come and go or some flanging that was harder to detect earlier and so on. And, and you've all just been through an exercise in the past few weeks of listening to a multi-track recording and identify what instruments are playing and notice who's playing when. Now is the time to advance that and to say not, not only what instruments are playing, I hear a vocal, I hear drums, I hear bass, I hear piano, I hear an organ, I hear a tambourine that's only in the last courses. All the stuff you've done for identifying who plays what, that's the multi-track arrangement. Now listen for the effects that are on each of those tracks. So listen one layer further into the mix uh, and start to identify what has reverb and what kind of reverb. Which tracks have an echo, if any, and what sort of echo do you hear on it, and so on. So it's a it's an advanced kind of listening that takes the skills you've already shown you have. I followed along uh, in the in the in the hangout. I see a lot of great analysis of the tunes that you've been doing. Add to that some analysis of when you hear certain effects. Mm -hmm. Great, and and that brings up a good point because this week we're starting to work with the full uh, stereo wave files of the multi-track in foundation of the songs that we're working with this week. Um, and so it's possible, and, and the, the tracks that are available this week are uh, what you would call dry tracks. They're the ones that uh, have, don't have the effects added to them. So you could queue up in one browser window uh, the stereo mix that we've been listening to for the first few weeks and then compare that, A, B, that with the dry mix to hear the absence of the effects. and then play around. So I mean one one thing that we're suggesting that everybody do is to play around and add those effects in. Um, this week particularly we're, we're uh, back working with uh, Clara Berry and Wooldog's um, air traffic and I know you've had a chance to listen to that. Is there anything that we should know about um, Brad's treatment of that uh, in the past or uh, it, it especially uh, as regards to these effects that we've been talking about today? Uh, sure. The I mean I, I guess I guess we could we could sort of break break it down track by track as I remember it. I have to confess that uh, I I don't have the track right in front of me, uh, but the um, my my recollection from listening to it. I don't know if your dry tracks are truly dry. If they are, that's really educational because the most important track in there for sure is the vocal, and on the vocal, Bradford Swanson has put a long reverb in at pretty low level and that he all that matters is what he thinks but my analysis of what Bradford probably was doing is that that reverb is in there for a lot of reasons one is to actually I think the most important reason is to support the vocal so this is this is already an advanced application of, of sound effects I described reverb to you just minutes ago as the resonance of a space and that we might add reverb to take a close microphone placement on a vocal and transport it back into an illusion of that singer in a real space. So I would call that simulating space with artificial reverb. That is a totally valid reason to use reverb. But I think the most important thing going on with Bradford's reverb is that it's to support the vocal. It's less about transporting her to a place and it's more to give the sort of decoration and decorrelated energy that a vocal needs to sound interesting in a recording. So it's already a pretty artificial concept, but our, our recorded works of art have a big challenge, which is that they have to, they have to affect people, but they are mediated by earplugs and loudspeakers. You don't get to see the artist. You only hear them, and you compare them to all the hyped recordings that you hear elsewhere on your playlist. And, and so there's kind of an obligation for the engineer and producer in pop music to make things sound better than the real thing, which is not a criticism of the singer. But we have to, exe we have to hype every lead singer's track. And one way to do that is to put this beautiful bed of decorrelated energy, meaning 
the stuff coming out left and right is slightly different. Our brain really loves that. Our brain really savors the slight differences left versus right. So we're listening to a lead vocal and we hear this sort of, it's really ear candy. We hear what the reverb does at low level, it just sort of resonates along and, and we like it, we love it. And so one reason for that reverb, and this is a common reason to add reverb in a mix, is to put in a low level ear grabbing, not grabbing, that overstates it, ear tingling sensation that, that I think of as supporting the vocal that makes people want to listen to her and, and notice her more, even though she's been forced to sing to us by way of headphones, earbuds, loudspeakers, or whatever. So that long reverb is there, I think, largely to support the vocal and make it seem a little bit wider within the stereo field and a little bit more interesting to listen to. Another obvious effect in the mix is the, uh, the baritone guitar, sort of this twanging guitar uh, which has, I believe it has tremolo on it, but it also for sure has spring reverb. So this is another intriguing use of reverb, and, and actually this is an important category of reverb, and that is to use reverb for timbre. In this case, I kind of think of it as a texture, which is, I can explain it if you want me to, but it's a cousin in my mind, a cousin of timbre. Um, but that spring reverb, it literally is a spring. It's, it's probably two or four springs, that live in a guitar amp, and when you play guitar, it makes the spring go boing, and then the boing gets sent to the loudspeaker with the guitar. I'm not, this is very high tech, isn't it? But it literally sounds like a spring. There's nothing hi-fi or theoretically accurate about it. It's letting a spring resonate while a guitarist makes a string resonate, but it has a really unique, interesting sound. And, and because it's a cheap, portable, light, reliable kind of resonance, it's in a lot of great guitar amps. And because it's been in a lot of great guitar amps since the 50s, we've grown accustomed to hearing it for certain styles of guitar performances. And this is a really good example of a kind of guitar part with simple single note lines that wants to twang, wants to have a little bit of added character. And so this spring reverb is not, again, not simulating the sound of a guitar in a church or in a concert hall. It's actually just modifying the timbre of the guitar. So I've just gone down a loop that says reverb can do at least three things. It can simulate space, it can modify timbre, and it can add support to a track. And those are actually the three most important reasons for using reverb. If I were to name, the, reverb can do, I don't know, a dozen things. Uh, those are the three most common motivations for reverb. And I hope you're noticing within this that that you have to have kind of a strategy and a sophisticated understanding of what's going on. Reverb is not just about simulating space. You sometimes choose reverb for the timbre, the tone, what it does to the signal, and you sometimes choose reverb for strategic reasons to help lift a, a single track and make it wider and more interesting. These are, uh, I would count these as kind of advanced uh, ways of thinking about reverb, but really essential ways of thinking about reverb. Great. Uh, I think that's a wonderful introduction to these three effects, and particularly with reference to uh, some of the material that we have available to work with. Um, and I guess at this point, I'd like to um, ask, is there anything else around this subject that you'd like to um, say before we open it up for questions, and also give that as a heads up to our uh, live audience to start thinking about your questions and uh, posting them in the discussion window? Sure. So I, I actually would come back to something I said in the earlier interview while most of you type your questions um, to say that it's um, you have in front of you an infinite set of choices and possibilities whenever you're involved in music, whether you're the drummer or the recording engineer, and, and it makes sense to prioritize it. And I think we ended the last interview with the way that I think about all this stuff and I'll just bore you with it now, but it's three words that guide my motivations. We, we fix problems, we fit things together, and then we feature aspects of it, any track that we think are worth featuring. So fix, fit, and feature are handy because they all start with the letter F. They're handy because they're short words so I can remember them, but they're also the right order. So if they're problems, and, and for air traffic, uh, there are no problems in the tune because Brad is that good. But if they're your tracks, you might have hum or buzz 
or ringing tones in the snare or something, you might have things you want to fix. Fix that stuff before you do anything else. Fitting is a really important thing. Fitting Tracks Together talks about getting the arrangement right, getting the orchestration right, fitting out, figuring out which tracks should play when and where to pan them. And if they're still, if it's hard to hear one track over another, then you introduce effects that make one track easier to hear and so on. So the jigsaw puzzle of fitting things together is the second step. And those two steps amount essentially to getting a good foundation and putting up good framing for your mix. And then you get to what I think too many of us start off with, which is the feature section, where we go for the fun part, the creative part, the wacky part, the crazy thing we know we want to do to make the piano swirl and do interesting things. Do that last. At least do it as a third step when you want to feature certain attributes but only do that fun, creative, a little bit more aggressive uh, technical stuff only after you've fixed known problems and carefully fit things together. So I think fix, fit, and feature is a reasonable guide for how you know when to EQ, when to filter, when to add reverb, when to add delay, and so on. Great. Uh, I'm still at this point uh, waiting for some, uh, some questions to emerge, so we'll go ahead and uh, just pause a minute and uh, allow the group to ask some questions, and I will be happy to relay them on to Alex. I put them to sleep. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> if you see G, 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 it just means their nose hit the keyboard. <laughs> Okay, we have our first question, uh, and it's from Orville, and he's asking, uh, how can you tell or how can you determine which type of reverb is the reverb you're hearing on a recording? Uh, that's, that's very difficult. That is analogous to asking, it's a great question, it's analogous to asking how can you tell if the piano is a Steinway or a, a Yamaha? How can you tell if the guitar is a Telecaster or a, or a Gretsch or a Les Paul? And the answer is that with time and experience, you'll be able to tell. And it's impossible if you've never had the chance to hear a Gretsch compared to a Strat, compared to a Telecaster, compared to a Les Paul. If you yourself in life haven't had the chance to hear them close together, you have no way of learning them. I mean, all guitarists can tell the difference if you're not a guitarist it's difficult to tell the difference. And so the way you'll learn to hear a lexicon reverb separate from a plate reverb, separate from a spring reverb, separate from a, um, some other chamber reverb, you know, the chamber reverb at Capitol or the, versus the chamber at Abbey Road, the way you learn to hear that is just through experience, getting the chance to hear it. Part of uh, one advantage that experienced recording engineers have over less experienced engineers is that we've done time in so many studios working with other people that we've got we've had the chance to hear different reverbs in isolation and to audition different reverbs that we don't own that some other studio had and so on so you just sort of learn it over time and and this makes me want to raise a bigger point that uh, that Alex doesn't he and I haven't had the chance to talk about but that he and I in other conversations I know we both think a lot about this which is um, the concept of timbre is really really a big concept and if I were to ask you what is timbre a lot of people might say timbre is it's the tone it's the thing I get out with equalization timbre is it's sort of the it's the fundamental plus all the overtones that define the sound of that instrument and it's true to say that timbre if the, the legal definition of timbre is it's how we can tell which instrument is playing if I have a violin and a piano and a human singer all sing the same note at the same level. If they sing the same pitch at the same level, it is timbre that then tells us which instrument it was. But if you analyze that a little bit further, 
what that means is the timbre isn't just the harmonic recipe that differentiates a piano from a violin, from a flute, from a from a human voice. Uh, it's not just the overtone series, the harmonic series that defines that instrument. It's also hugely connected to the way the note begins. We can tell if a hammer hit a string or if it's a flute. We can we actually hear the sound. We may not know how to play flute, but we can we can tell the difference between a flute and piano as they play the same pitch at the same level because you hear the sound of breath on plumbing. We can tell if it's a bow on a string or a pick on a string. So part of timbre for sure is the harmonic series that separates a guitar from a piano, from a flute, from a voice. But it's not just the steady state harmonic series. It's also how the, the shape of the note, how it begins. Mm -hmm. And also, to a lesser extent, how it ends. You can tell if a piano ended with someone lifting their foot off the pedal or if a guitarist lifted their finger off the string or the, the trombone player stopped blowing, which we're always praying for. Um, hmm. Trombone joke, that's free. Um, so the way notes begin and end are also a big part of timbre. So timbre is this deep concept about harmonic structure and amplitude envelope, how the note begins and how the note ends. And, and you've spent some time listening to a mix, listening for the different tracks within the multi-track mix so that you can hear, does this mix have piano? Does it have guitar? Does it have electric guitar versus acoustic guitar? Does it have organ and so on? That's an important exercise. A lot of people have difficulty with that. Our obligation, though, is to take timbre to the next level. Orville's like, this is not the question I asked, but I'm going off on timbre because I care a lot, a lot about this. Now going to bring it back to your question, which is, it is our obligation, it's our responsibility as recording engineers to hear further into timbre than that. It's no longer enough for us to hear the difference between a flute and a piano and a female voice as they all play A above middle C. We have to go further than that. We have to understand timbre so well that we can hear a guitar play a note at a certain level and know, is it a Tele or a Strat or a Gretsch? And back to your question at last, we have to be able to hear a reverb and eventually we have to know what kind of reverb was that? A plate or a spring or a hall or a house of worship? So the idea of timbre, it, when, once our music is within a computer, once it's a digital audio workstation creation, our, our threshold for timbre is now is really zoomed in. We're going to make choices about timbre that are, it's not just an acoustic guitar, but it's an Alvarez or a Taylor or um, what's that guitar behind Alex? I'm going to guess Martin. So we have to be able to hear, is it a Gibson, a Martin, a Taylor, an Alvarez acoustic guitar? It's not enough to say it's an acoustic guitar and I like it. We get really zoomed in on the idea of timbre, which is about its overtone series and the way the notes begin and the way the notes end. And it's true for reverbs and delays and so on. Yeah. Well, I, and, and I would say, you know, a practical resource that I've, I've been using, obviously, um, is to go is to look at the Recordingology site because there you are also able to, you know, you've broken things down by this is a spring reverb, this is a plate reverb, and so for the for the, everybody in the course who already is kind of used to going there, you can zero in and listen to some specific, yeah, sorry, some specific recordings that um, use those different reverbs, but otherwise there's no substitute for just playing around and listening and learning through listening, right? That's absolutely true. Great. So uh, there's some follow-up questions in here um, uh, related to that. Another one quickly from, from Orville where he's just raising the point. So it's, so it's timbre that helps him know John from Paul from George. Also vocally, you've been talking about instrumental timbres, um, but that also is the case for, for differentiating different singers. That, uh, that, I mean, that is perfect. So if you're, that, that is just a perfect launching point. If, if you know the Beatles well enough to know John from Paul, and the occasional George, I mean, you can't miss Ringo, right? But when you're hearing the vocal, if you can tell which of the lads is singing, that is a more sophisticated ear for timbre than the average listener has. And that's a perfect analogy for what we try to do with the other instruments we care about. So I'm a guitarist. When I listen to guitar, I sometimes dwell on it. Is it a Strat or a Telly or a Gretsch or a Les Paul and so on? And, we, and I certainly do the same thing with which compressor is it, which reverb is it, uh, and so on. That's a really good analogy. Great. So we have another question from Bob. 
uh, who is referencing back to your, uh, your mentioning of ear candy and, and left and right. Is that an artifact of reverb, or is there something that needs to be done to accomplish that? That, that is built into the reverb patch. And in fact, reverb is the, probably the best effect you'll have in a digital audio workstation for creating this indescribable interest that our hearing system has for, I mean, think about how we listen to music. In part, we're doing a little bit of pattern recognition. We, we love the melody, and the melody's going to repeat. We hear the rhythm, and the rhythm's going to repeat. And we hear when the pattern changes up, and we savor those moments when a beat gets dropped and so on. So we are a pattern recognition machine, and something about that has us listening to low-level information left versus right. And when they're slightly different, we notice that just as if the melody went a different place or the rhythm uh, went a different place. So reverb is a great effect because it's one of the few stereo effects we're likely to have in our digital audio workstation. And by stereo, really what I mean is that it has two outputs which are related but slightly different. And that is, that is pretty definitionally ear candy. Our brain just loves that most of the time if we have the chance to hear it. I mm -hmm. should admit that it... As an effect, it's essential to a great professional recording, but only the great listeners are going to hear it. So if someone's off-center, they can't quite enjoy it, If in their earbuds one of them's kind of damaged, they're not going to be able to savor the exquisite sameness and differentness between those. But for anyone who's gone to the trouble to listen carefully, they're going to love that effect, and reverb is, a, is, a, is, is the best way to create it. You can also do it with delay. The delay in Soundation uh, has two outputs. You'll see that it's a, we would call it a stereo delay, and you can, you can have the output go to, to the left side first at maybe an eighth note, and then a quarter note later it pops out to the right. That's another kind of ear candy where things ping pong back and forth, or the delays happen left and right at slightly different times. Uh, for some reason, our brain grabs onto those things, and we're either kind of pissed off, it's distracting, but if we can make it make musical sense, which is to say tuck it into the rhythm of the tune or not have it be too mentally jarring when they don't fall at the same time, if we can back off on the distraction and make it more an exquisite part of the arrangement, it's another kind of ear candy. But this one's done with delays instead of reverb. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Justin who uh, asks if there's any particular effect you find yourselves necessarily always using. Um, the, the right answer, I'll, I'll give you the correct answer and then, then I'll give you the truth. Um, the correct answer is to only use the effects that the mix calls for. And it's possible that you could be given tracks that don't need reverb or don't need equalization. E EQ is maybe a better example where, if, I mean, imagine, I don't know if you know who Al Schmidt is, but you should Google him. He's a famous recording engineer who does big band orchestral stuff and, and pop things, and he's famous for not using EQ. He's also famous for working in the best studios in the world because he's earned it. So he'll put, he'll put up microphones on a, on a big band, and the microphones exceed the annual salary of everyone currently participating in this in terms of price point. So he's working with wonderful pieces of equipment, and he has the ears to figure out which mic should go on which horn and which drum and where they should be. Anyway, so he's this amazing tracking engineer and mix engineer uh, who could give you tracks, and you would just push up the faders and say, oh, I am a genius. I'm the best recording engineer ever, and it's because his tracks are so perfect. He's so beautifully captured the sound of those instruments, and they fall together the way he records. But you might otherwise get tracks that sound a little dull or sound a little murky or sound like they have too much low end and then you have to start adjusting them. So the answer is you only use the effects that the tracks call for and sometimes you don't need any EQ and sometimes you have to EQ things a lot until the track sounds right depending on the history of those tracks before you ever heard them. And it is possible you need no effects. I would not say there are any effects I use all the time. I truly am motivated by the production. What do I hear missing? What do I hear that needs fixing? What do I hear where tracks are interfering with each other, where I need to correct it so they fit together better? And then what am I inspired by? What if what track needs an echo in quarter note time? Or, or what track needs a really lush, long reverb? Um, I only react to the music. It's, there's, it's, in truth, 
you're not supposed to always use effects. It would be a mistake to say, oh, here's the snare drum. I always put reverb on snare, so let's dial up reverb on the snare. Don't do that. Listen to the snare in the context of the mix and decide what reverb might do for you for that snare. So that's the correct answer. In truth, I think it's fair to say that reverb and, and compression, which we aren't really probably going to talk about today, but reverb and compression sneak into every single mix uh, for various reasons, just because once, once you get to the mix stage, it is usually difficult to put many tracks together in a way that sounds satisfying without giving someone a touch of reverb and controlling one of the tracks with some compression. Great. We have a follow-up question from, from Justin, um, who asks, when recording, do you find it better to use effects in the computer after recording a clean sound or record the sound coming out of an amp with the sound applied before, beforehand, such as like a pedal with a guitar? Um, that's, a, that's a common question, and, and there is no right answer. If, um, if, if someone told you never track with effects, always do effects later and track it pure and clean, I would say they're wrong. And if someone said, I always track with effects, never track clean, get on it, fix it, do the effect the day you track it, I would say they're, they're wrong. I think it's a judgment you have to make. It's a complicated judgment you have to make that you'll get better at with experience. I'm, I'm not of the point of view that you never or always track with effects. Um, it really depends. And to give you some ideas, if, if I'm recording a track and I hear a spectral problem, I hear low-end rumble, there's too much low-end in the bass or some sort of 200 hertz muddiness that I hear and I know it's wrong, I'm going to pull it out when I track it. I'm going to do subtractive EQ to attenuate the stuff I don't like because I know today that it's wrong. So things that are clear to me from the beginning that are need to be dealt with, whether it's to fix things or to do something a little bit fancier, I'll do it when I track it. So if I have a strong point of view at that moment, I'll go for it. And that's a little risky, so you, you make that decision with experience uh, and with courage. But if I have in mind while tracking some more finessed things that I want to do of, wouldn't this sound interesting with a little bit of high end? I'm not sure, but maybe. Well, I'm going to save those decisions to mix down because it's difficult to know what the right final EQ for piano is until I've tracked strings and guitars and vocals and background vocals and tambourine and shaker and triangle and all that. So basically the idea is if I hear something I know is wrong or I have a strong opinion that I know what is right, then I'll track with that. If I have ideas but I'm not sure, I'll sort of file them away as I'm recording them but I won't commit them while I record. I'll wait until I mix later because I might I might predict that incorrectly. Yeah. Well, that that reminds me of some you know some experiences that I had around that where sometimes I would you know in in my prior life when I did a little bit of this you know we would track both the uh, a direct sound and uh, and an affected sound uh, to two separate tracks and then be able to blend the two or do that as well. Is there is there do you have any comments around that kind of an approach? Yeah, that's a very good approach. So if, if your studio has the infrastructure, which is to say if you have enough inputs and you have enough tracks, then it, it, it often makes sense to track a clean version as sort of this reference, almost safety idea, but then to follow your heart and soul and to track what you think sounds right um, and, and track them separately to different tracks so that you have access to both of them to mix and match and, and let that also lead to other interesting things months from now after you finish all the overdubs and record everything and start mixing. And I should say, by the way, what I didn't mention before, tracking with effects, if the effect is really part of the tone of the instrument or the effect is part of the groove of the tune, then I would always track with it. So if uh, let, let's say we're all just sort of sitting in our studio and you two walks in, and they say, can you record us? But they say it with an Irish accent, which I won't uh, attempt. Well, The Edge probably almost never plays guitar without having thought about tone, and especially he's famous for these echo effects. So when The Edge boots up the guitar and starts playing guitar, those echoes are part of the groove. And so you would track his echoes, for sure. To try to synthesize them later, you might not have it fit into the pocket. The drummer wants to hear those echoes that the edge is playing with, and so you would track, 
for something where the effect is so much part of the tune, track the musician's effects. Great. If the guitarist walks in and just says, well, I kind of like this and I've got this chorus pedal, it came free with a guitar, you might want to say, well, that chorus effect, maybe I can do better later. What if we track you clean? But if the edge walks in and has a rhythmic groove, you track his effects for sure. Great. Well, there's been a, a thread here of uh, talking about using effects to either make a live correction or working with that. Um, this uh, follows on to a question Lisa's asked. Are there other uh, common problems that you often uh, run into that, 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 you, that need to be fixed other than the ones we've just talked about? Uh, yes. Can I just say that? <laughs> I guess not. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's too long a list. Uh, so one common problem is is, is distortion uh, that you get a track that is distorted and and it's barely possible in a really expensive studio to undistort a signal. So the fix for distortion is to prevent it. So if you're the recording engineer, always be on the lookout for unwanted distortion. Distortion that comes from uh, recording things too hot, from turning something up too loud, so you're overdriving something accidentally. So, so distortion is a common problem, and the fix is to not have distorted it. Okay. So that's a little bit of a confusing thing. Well, uh, no, that's fine. There's actually a, another follow-on question that might uh, that that Allison asks here, which is also kind of in this vein, um, is that you know you spoke about EQ and how that can in increase and lower the volume in the middle and low and high ranges, uh, and she says you know sometimes after she's EQ'd a track she'll have a lot of loss of volume. Can you explain why that might happen and how she might be able to resolve that? Um, so so the, the idea of EQ is that it can boost some frequencies and cut others. If you're doing what we call subtractive EQ, where you're cutting things, first of all, that, that would make the track possibly quieter, and for that I would congratulate you, because I think that Subtractive EQ is a, it's a more mature mix move. Most people listen to a track and they grab the EQ control and they turn things up and they hear that and they like it and they think, I'm so clever, it sounds better, but turning things up isn't very clever. You've just made it easier to hear. It's a more sophisticated bit of listening to turn things down and listen to the result of that and decide if you like it better. So subtractive EQ can lead to signals which are quieter but it also can lead to more effective signals, signals that are going to be easier to fit into a mix. Not every track gets to be, not every individual track gets to be full of energy from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. We have to choose pockets for some instruments. So subtractive EQ likely means that you're doing the right thing for those tracks because now it's, it's a smaller track, smaller in the frequency domain, but when you fit it into the mix, it's not going to drown out other tracks but it's likely still to be heard. So the solution to that is you just turn it up. So if you end up with a signal that's a lot quieter, don't view that as a negative, but recognize, hey, I did so much subtractive EQ that I'm now going to have to push the fader back up. Uh, I would say congratulations, push the fader up, and recognize you have a smaller, easier to use signal. As long as, let's imagine that's guitar, as long as that guitar doesn't sound totally disappointing, then that subtractive EQ might have been a really good idea because now there's room for piano and vocals and strings and organ and all that stuff. So just just push the level back up is what I would recommend. Great. So uh, we have, I think, one last question here, which is a nice one to kind of uh, perhaps end on and zoom out. What is one example of a recording that you've worked on that you're most proud of? Uh, <laughs> the, the most mad... I, I, I sort of am heartbreaking, heartbroken to say this, uh, but I think a lot of recording engineers feel this way. The One of the pleasures of being a recording engineer is you get to hang, hang out with amazing musicians. And the most amazing musical moments that I've had in my life, I think it would be fair to say, certainly the most amazing musical moments I've had in the studio are things that never made it to tape, or never made it to the final mix. Did I say tape? I'm showing my age again. Uh, so some of my favorite mixes, some of my favorite vocal performances are things that happened. It was a thrill to be there, and for whatever reason, it didn't make sense in the tune, and we had to erase it and try something else anyway. So to answer that truthfully, my favorite musical moments 
are not available. They're gone. And, and a lot of what the recordings I did are from the 90s before things were totally digital, so we couldn't just keep all the versions. Things were analog, so they're, I mean, they're gone. They're erased. They're re-recorded. Uh, so I sort of hang on to those moments of, I can't believe the singer could do that. That's one of the most amazing things. I didn't know a human could do that, and she just nailed it. What a beautiful thing. And we're going to erase it now because the pub producer wants something else to happen. So I guess I would give that as my answer because I think you have to be prepared for that. The things that you might like most may not be what are right for the project, may not be what, what the band wants. Uh, so you just sort of hang on to them, savor them, and, uh, and try to remember them but let it go uh, because they're gone. Great. Well, I just want to what thank you. What a melancholy you. person I am. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, but I want to just thank you again for uh, taking the time, uh, this time later, more in the musician time of night uh, rather than our bright and early Saturday mornings. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to share and uh, answer these questions. Uh, it, and I guess I'll just uh, leave it again. Uh, do you have any uh, anything else that you'd like to leave us with before we sign off for the evening? I, I think we've covered it. I mean, thank you for, for being able, thank you everyone for putting up with the, uh, the glitches. The truth is, uh, for the last interview that didn't happen, it's because it was 9 in the morning, so all I did was uh, I broke my modem, and then we blamed, the, blamed it on Alex for being in Australia. But the truth is I wanted to do it at this hour uh, because I'm now finally awake. Um, but I, I, want, I want you to know that I'm following along loosely in the activities of this course and seeing the comments and listening to some of your mixes and looking at some of your analysis uh, and and I'm impressed with the effort and the quality and uh, so I'm finally getting inspired so I would encourage you to keep on making this effort and keep on doing what you're doing and thanks for including me because I think it's really fun what you guys are up to. Great. Well, thanks again for your time and uh, we'll see the rest of you online on the Play With Your Music site and uh, we'll see you all uh, next week. Good night.